um, my lecture today is on a 16th century Quran that is part of the collection of the American mining magnate and philanthropist Sir Alfred Chester Beatty, and which is now housed in Dublin in the library that bears his name. The manuscript was produced in Shiraz in southwest Iran. It is signed by the calligrapher Ruzbahan Muhammad Atabia Shirazi, whose name appears in another five Qurans. He is presumably the individual who, whom Qadi Ahmad refers to in his late 16th century treatise on calligraphers and painters simply as Malana Ruzbahan, and whom he cites as being one of the four stellar callig calligraphers of 16th century Shiraz. The manuscript is not dated, but work on it probably began about 1550, by which time Shiraz had been a major center of book production for some two centuries. Although the city was mainly a center of commercial production, fine manuscripts, the result of princely and other high-level patronage, were also produced there. Unfortunately, there is nothing in the manuscript to indicate for whom it was made. But considering the cost of producing a manuscript as finely and extensively direct, de, um, decorated as it is, the patron had to be a wealthy, presumably well-placed individual. What I will present to you today are a few of the observations and findings resulting from a close and detailed study of the manuscript. Some of these concern the production of the manuscript's superb illuminations, while others concern the text and calligraphy of the manuscript. But before I begin, I want to explain briefly how this project came about. Like many Qurans of the time, Chester Beatty's Ruzbahan Quran is large and heavy, though not nearly as large as the Iljaitu manuscript. It consists of 445 folios, or some 890 pages, each measuring about 17 by 12 inches. The paper and the pigments of the almost 500-year-old manuscript had survived the centuries in overall good condition, except for one major problem. On each page, several narrow bands of colored pigments and gold surround the text. And on the screen now is a typical opening of the text, and beneath it, a detail of the text frame. The green band is the copper-bearing pigment known as a tachymite. Over the centuries, the copper had burned completely through the paper in many places, causing the text area to become partially dis dislodged from the rest of the page. When a page of the manuscript was turned, um, uh, sorry, when, the page, when a page of the manuscript was turned, the pressure created by the bending of the page often caused further tearing along the line of, his, uh, line of its existing, existing damage. As well, the loosened areas of one page often became interlocked with those of the preceding and following pages, causing yet more damage when the folios were turned. Because of this, the manuscript could not be put on display, nor could, could, could it be made available to researchers. Therefore, in 2012, it was decided that the manuscript would be temporarily disbound to allow conservation of its folios to take place. During the course of conservation, a few curious aspects of the manuscript became apparent, and so it was decided that once conservation was completed, the manuscript would, re would remain unbound for a period of time to allow further research of its folios to take place. Chester Beatty's Ruzbahan Quran and other 16th century Shiraz Qurans typically employ a standard program of illumination that marks the beginning, middle, and end of the text, and which differs from that used in earlier centuries. This standard program of illumination begins with um, paired shamses inscribed with verse 88 of chapter 17 of the Quran, and these are the ones from the Chester Beatty manuscript now on the screen. Following the shamsas is a frontispiece inscribed with the first surah of the Quran. Illuminated openings announce the beginning of the second and 18th surahs, the latter of which marks the approximate middle of the manuscript. And a finished piece surrounds the final surahs. And this is just a detail of the shamsas. Following the finished piece is a prayer to be read once one has, completed a, um, has finished a complete reading of the text. And finally, there is a fall name, a manual on using the Quran for prognostication and which is typically written in Nastalik script. Only one page of what was originally a two-page prayer has survived in the Chester Beatty manuscript, and no part of the fall name has survived although existing codicological evidence indicates that one originally existed and that it covered the final two openings of the manuscript. 
the illuminations of the Chester Beatty manuscript are quite magnificent, especially the openings that mark the beginning, middle, and end of the text. This is the frontispiece, and in this opening and throughout the manuscript, there are hints as to how the artists work. For example, if you look closely at the details of the frontispiece, you can see that in some places the colored pigments have flaked, revealing the gold beneath them. Also in some places, though you probably won't be able to see it, bits of the colored blossoms and leaves extend over the edge of the white script. So we know that the artist painted the gold ground first, then the white script was added, and then the colored blossoms and leaves. We can also determine that once these elements of the decoration were in place, the black outline that surrounds both the white script and all the tiny mo motifs was added. You may also be able to see that the gold ground has been punched. Doing so was a long standard practice and was carried out so that the resulting tiny indentations created an uneven surface that added a sense of, a sense of depth to the composition. In the flickering candlelight by which the manuscript would often have been viewed, these indentations would catch the light and an actual sense of movement across the surface would likely have resulted. Oh, I went one too many. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, the image on the left is, is um, one half of the opening that marks the approximate middle of the manuscript or the, the, with the heading at the top um, that marks the beginning of this uh, Sir El Kaf. Um, unusually, the blue ground, which you can see on the, left, the right hand side, unusually the blue ground or the cartouche of the heading has been punched and each small indentation, indentation has been filled with a tiny dab of gold to create the same effect as with a punched gold ground. The lower image is of an area of purple ground found elsewhere in the manuscript, and it too has been punched. The punching of a colored ground as here seems not to have been common, although a much earlier example produced in the 1470s is also known. The dark blue ground seen here is a detail of the frontispiece. The, pigment is, the dark blue pigment is ultramar ultramar ultramarine, the pigment made from the mineral lapis lazuli. Because of its particle structure, lapis is apparently very difficult to work with, in part because it absorbs any pigment that is painted over top of it. Therefore, unlike the areas of gold ground, all the tiny blossoms and other motifs that you see here, including the very fine gold, oh, sorry, including the very fine gold vines, were added first, and then the artist added the thick blue pigment, carefully painting around all these tiny details. However, in a few places in the manuscript, there are panels of dark blue on top of which there is gold script. Some of the pigments have been scientifically tested, and the tests reveal that in these panels, the lapis has been covered with a waxy sort of substance that wasn't identified, but, that which, but which allowed the calligrapher to write over top of the lapis. In yet many other places, the blue has been mixed with lead white to form a, a lighter shade of blue, and this seems, too seems to have allowed the artist to paint over top of it. The bulk of the manuscript, of course, consists of openings of text, such as this one. On each page, the text is arranged as a series of panels of single, long lines of large-scale script and short lines of smaller-scale script. The specific text lay this specific text layout became popular in the late 15th century and is typical of many 16th century Qurans, both those made in Shiraz and those made elsewhere. The small scale script is co copied in black ink is Nask. In the Ruzbahan Quran, the large scale script is copied in either blue or gold ink, and in the upper and lower panels, the script is always muhakak, and in the middle panel, it is always thulth. In most manuscripts, the large-scale script is copied onto an undecorated ground, but here lines of gold ink are copied onto a ground covered with sprinkles of pink pigment, and lines of blue ink are copied onto a ground covered with both pink and, blue, uh, pink and gold sprinkles. The arrangement of ink colors, and hence the, the arrangement of the de ground decoration too, alternates from opening to opening. And so you can see here in the upper and lower panels of this opening, um, the upper and lower panels are, are gold ink, and the middle panel is blue, but then the opposite arrangement takes place on this consecutive opening. The 
Throughout the manuscript, there is evidence of different artists being involved in each area of the decoration. For example, variations in the pink sprinkled grounds suggest that a number of different artists were responsible for decorating these large-scale script panels. Sometimes there appears to be a difference in the density of the application of the pigment, but sometimes it seems to be due to differences in how the pigment was applied. While usually there are distinct sprinkles of color, as in the image on the upper left, other times the pigment appears blotchy, as though applied with something akin to a sponge, as in the upper right image. Yet other times, as in the lower image, there is merely a pale wash of color with no real sense of individual sprinkles of pigment at all. Copying the text was a potentially confusing task. A different reed pen with a nib cut in a specific manner was needed for each of the three scripts, and for some, a different size of pen was then used to add the voweling. Copying the text by beginning at the top of a page and continuing to the bottom of it would have involved a, continually cha a continual changing of pens and ink colors, not to mention the constant mental adjustment needed to switch from writing one style of script to another. It would also mean that a pen with expensive gold or blue ink on it would be left sitting while a script in another ink color was being written. However, it seems that in order to avoid these problems, the calligrapher instead copied the text non-continuously. For example, he may have copied all the lines of blue Mohawk script first, then all the lines of gold Mohawk, and then the lines of Thoth, again copying the lines of one ink color before moving on to those in another color. Once all the lines of large-scale script were completed, he then filled in the remaining panels with small-scale black Nass script. The working, th this working process is, dis is suggested by the survival of tiny notes along the edges of some folios. These notes state exactly what text did be copied in each of the large-scale script panels. The notes, which should have been trimmed away during the binding process, are also found in certain other Qurans. They do not exist for the panels of Nas script because they were not needed. Once all the large-scale script had been copied, it was more or less a question of merely filling in the blanks. Once all the script had been copied and all the vowel marks added, the small walk signs were at inserted. These are the small letters, which are abbreviations of words and phrases, that are placed above the lines of text and which function basically as punctuation for the reciter. Eleven different walk signs are used in the Ruzbahan Quran. In the lines of black Nas script, these small recitation marks were added in red ink, but in the lines of large scale, or bl large scale blue or gold ink, they were added in green ink. The green ink is again the copper bearing pigment, pigment atacamite, but surprisingly, these green recitation marks seem never to have caused any damage to the paper. According to Chester Be the, the Chester Beatty Library Senior Conservator, the pigment's corrosiveness may have been kept in check through the addition of saffron, though it is curious that this preventative measure would not have been taken with the, in, with the, with the text area frame also. Small red or green numeral twos also appear throughout the text. These alert the reader to an alternate pronunciation of the word above which the two is placed, as in the upper image. There are also 38 marginal notes in the manuscript, written in red ink, which also instruct the reader as to the correct or an alternate pronunciation of a word. In these cases, a red or green two indicates the word in the main text to which the note refers, as in the lower image. Based on the content of these marginal notes, it is clear that the specific reading used in the Ruzbahan Quran is that of Hafs, the eighth century transmitter of the reading, uh, read, sorry, the eighth century transmitter of the reading of the Kufan scholar Asim. This is the reading that was adopted by the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, making it the most widely recognized reading of its time. And it is, of course, the reading that is still the most popular today. The alternate pronunciations indicated in the notes and in the margin and in the additions to the text are those of the, um, are though conform to the reading of Haft's contemporary Shuba. Although it might be expected that this type and placement of the recitation marks would be the same in all manuscripts of the same reading of the Quran, a brief comparison of the manuscripts has shown this not to be the case. 
Once the recitation marks, the reading notes, and the small grain chews had all been added, the lines of black NAS script were all covered with a layer of gold sprinkles, as you can see from the detail on the screen. Next, the verse markers were added. The Quran consists of more than 6,000 verses, and thus there are more than 6,000 small verse markers in the manuscript. Yet each little device is in itself a, little, a work of art. Different types of verse markers are used for the two different sizes of script. The one on the screen is used only within the lines of NASC. A great deal of time has obviously been lav lavished on these tiny devices. In particular, the contour of each little, each little gold petal of the more than 6,000 rosettes has been carefully punched. Oh, sorry. I forgot to show you that one. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, okay. You've had a quick look. You can see all the little petals are punched. Um, this, um, the much smaller snail-shaped verse marker now on the screen is also sometimes used, but it seems to be used as a correction, added in places where a verse marker had mistakenly not been added. And when the omission was caught, this little device was added, but apparently by someone less ambitious than those who added the other more intricate markers. Omissions of the text also occurred. Several times, it is obvious that the calligrapher was confused by the occurrence of the same word or phrase twice within a short section of text. And as a result, he omitted the second occurrence of it. In the slide now on the screen, the omission occurred on the right-hand page of the opening in the upper block of NAS, NAS script. Once caught, the omitted text was added in a smaller hand, as you can see in the lower image. As the added words are covered with gold sprinkles, as are all the lines of NAS script, we know that the omission was caught early on, perhaps almost as soon as the calligrapher had finished this section of the text. A second omission occurred on this same opening, this time on the left-hand page in the lower panel of gold Mohawk script. Once the calligrapher had finished copying the line, the line of text, he went back and added the vowel markings using blue, blue, not gold ink. The omitted word is at the end of the line of script, and because it too is written in blue ink, it can be assumed that the calligrapher caught the omission as he was in the process of adding the vowel marks, and that he decided to add the skipped word simply using the pen and ink that he then had to hand. Over 50 such omissions were made and corrected. However, considering the length of the text, this is really a, quite a small number. 11 actual errors, as opposed to omissions, were also made and corrected. These all occur in the lines of large-scale script. Different methods of correcting these errors have been used, probably indicating that the corrections were made by different people and probably at different periods in the manuscript's history. In the example now on the screen, the error occurred more or less in the center of the detail shown in the lower image. Here, and in several other cases, the original ink has been greatly lightened, presumably licked off the surface of the paper, probably before the ink was completely dry, so that only a faint ghost of the letters remains. Indeed, an 8th century source notes that, at that time at least, licky, um, licking the still moist, still moist ink was a usual method of erasure, and that one of the traits of manliness was the ink on a man's clothes and lips. <laughs> the specific layout of the text used in the, in the manuscript results in small vertical panels at either side of each block of NAS script. In most manuscripts, these panels are decorated, although, in, uh, sorry, in most manuscripts, these panels are undecorated, although in some they might be filled with a few simple gold blossoms or some sort of more elaborate decoration, but which is identical on every page. In the Ruzbahan Quran, the panels are always decorated with one of two t basic types of decoration, with the second type varying from opening to opening. There are more than 3,000 of these panels in the manuscript, and some 13% of them are filled with multicolored blossoms on a gold ground, as in the opening now on the screen. This is just 
Always, in each panel, there are three lotuses, and set between them are small, usually red and blue blossoms that sort of resemble small butterflies. Various tiny leaves, rosettes, and buds are also included. Many different artists were involved in this aspect of the manuscript's decoration, as is evident for, as, from a comparison of the panels. And you can see in the small lotuses at the top that they're shaped differently and they're all shaded differently. The other 87% of these vertical panels are filled with monochrome blossoms set against the colored ground, as in this opening. The same types and the same arrangement of blossoms are used as in the gold ground panels. But because the blossoms are monochrome and because the petals never overlap, the blossoms appear as though they have been stenciled onto the colored grounds. However, they have in fact been painted with a brush. Blossoms that are gold or black, such as the one on the screen, have been painted using a one-step process. However, as you can see here from the detail of the single lotus, the petals of other blossoms were first painted using a thin wash of pigment, and then the tips of the petals were overpainted using a slightly thicker version of the same pigment. And then these are just two more examples for you to look at. Um, I should point out that these tiny lotuses are usually less than a quarter of an inch long, with the longest petals being more than, no more than an eighth of an inch long. So being able to paint them at all, let alone painting one layer and then adding a second one onto the tip of each pe uh, petal is actually quite a feat. And again, differences in the execution of the blossoms indicate that several individuals were responsible for the decoration of these small vertical panels. The grounds onto which these small blossoms are painted are in a wide range of colors. Never is the same color, oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry, I'm looking at the screen. And, um, never is the same color, sorry, never is the same ground color used for two consecutive openings. And some colors are used on only one opening in the manuscript, such as the black, black and brown grounds on these, pan, on these folios that you now see on the screen. Blue is the most popular ground color, and numerous tints, tones, and shades of blue and of other colors are used. However, what is especially surprising is that some of these small panels consist of a separate piece of dyed paper that has been pasted in place and then the small blossoms painted over top. These are all the plant panels in various shades of peach, such as these ones, and in various shades of gray and green, and there are also some sand-colored panels that are dyed paper. Presumably, the, desi the desired colors and effects could not be obtained with ordinary pigments, and so the paper was dyed. The paper itself seems thin and is characterized by the presence of long, dark fibers that seem to absorb the dye more than the surrounding paper. And you can see these darker fibers at the lower part of this uh, detail on the right-hand image. As far as I'm aware, pasted on panels of illumination such as these are not found in any earlier manuscript, or even for that matter, in any contemporary manuscript. However, as we'll see, pasted on panels are also found elsewhere in the manuscript. The folio now on the screen is just one of more, more than 400 such folios in the manuscript. Every single part of the text area is covered with some sort of decoration. The decoration is, however, rather restrained. Um, the decoration of the shamsas in the frontispiece is more dramatic, both in terms of the palette and the arrangement and number of motifs. They are spectacular, but there's really nothing unusual or unexpected about them. However, the final 10 openings of text, immediately preceding the finis piece, are exceedingly different from anything one might expect. And in fact, they are something of a shock, for they are, ex they are executed in a st strikingly different aesthetic. On these folios, the same basic elements and motifs are used as in the rest of the manuscript, but a change of taste has occurred, one that can be seen in broad terms as a move from a more classical style of decoration to one in which an almost discordant conglomeration of patterns and colors prevails. 
And then these are just a couple more of these folios from the end of the manuscript. It's obvious that these pages were originally intended to be the same as all other text pages, because in some cases, the original ground decoration of the large-scale script panel is visible around the edges of the script, which is itself original. So at the bottom here, you've actually got black script, black large-scale script, black Muhakak instead of blue. And then in this detail, you can see that they've outlined it, and then in between the outline and the actual letter is the original ground decoration, yeah. Um, okay. It seems that at some point, after the text had all been copied, but before the manuscript had been completed, the decision was made to alter the aesthetic of the manuscript. Presumably, it was originally intended that all folios would be reworked. This is the finished piece that surrounds the final surahs of the manuscript. It immediately, it immediately follows a sequence of 10 reworked openings, and it appears to be a sort of transitional work. The wide outer border is more or less in the classical style of the Champs in the frontispiece, but it is otherwise in the new aesthetic. Likewise, this opening, which marks the beginning of the second surah, seems to incorporate aspects of both the old and new aesthetic. And to a certain degree, this is true too of the opening now on the screen and which marks the approximate middle of the manuscript, the Surah al kaf Yeah. The desire to exper oh, wait a minute. The desire to experiment with new colors and effects that might seem to be indicated by the dyed and pasted on vertical panels of the standard text folios is evident also in some of the folios in which this new aesthetic is evident. The ground of the cartouche at the lower right of the finished piece is black. An expanse of black pigment as large as this is unusual in Persian painting. And the cartouche is, in fact, a separate piece of paper that has been pasted in place. As you can see on the screen, the lower left image of the cartouche is missing. And it is clear that there is nothing underneath it. Therefore, the cartouche was not pasted over some earlier botched or damaged design. Instead, nothing but this black pasted on panel was ever intended to fill this space. On another folio, the brown cartouche in the center of a sur heading has also been pasted in place. And here, on, on this opening, the slightly greenish-brown panel in the middle of each page is also a separate piece of paper pasted in place. These are unusual pigments, at least within the context of Persian painting. And perhaps, not being as familiar with them as with other pigments, it was simply deemed prudent to produce them as separate pieces of paper that could later, if all turned out well, be pasted in place. Based on the number of surviving manuscripts, the number of Qurans produced in Shiraz during the 16th century far exceeded that of any preceding period. Many are clearly commercial productions, with fine illuminations, but with little variation from manuscript to manuscript. However, like so many of the manuscripts we've seen today, Chester Beattie's Ruz Perhan Quran is exceptional. And as I said at the outset of my lecture, it must surely have been produced for a wealthy and highly placed individual. We may never know for who, for who it was produced or any other details of its history, but by examining its folios closely, we can learn much about the methods and techniques used by the artists of the 16th century. Thank you.